Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Nick Lugo Show, the 100th episode. Wow, I am so shocked, so surprised, and I'm so happy that I was able to bring in such an incredible guest today. I brought in Mark Metry. Yes, that Mark Metry, the one who started the Human 2.0 movement, one of the top 100 podcasts in the Apple Podcasts, as well as, well, a man who has just been able to be called a LinkedIn celebrity. I absolutely love that term. And this man has changed so many lives, made an impact on so many people. And, well, I'm so happy that I got him on my podcast. The story is, well, I hit him up about a year ago saying, hey, Mark, um, my name's Nick Lugo. You don't know me, but I love, I love to get some advice because I'm thinking about starting a podcast. And, well, I hit him up a year later after he gave me some great advice saying, hey, buddy, I'm looking to start to have my 100th podcast episode, and I'd love for you to be my 100th guest. And, well, again, he was so hospitable, he was so incredible, and he's like, yes, man, I'd love to be a guest. And, well, he he really killed it. He's such an incredible guy, such an incredible speaker, and, well, I hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoy. There's not much left to say besides definitely check out the sponsors in the description, give me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I hope you enjoy this 100th episode of The Nick Lugo Show with Mark Metry. The first question I want to ask you is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and it is, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Oh, my God. <laughs> You're crazy, man. Nah, I'm just kidding. Um, how do I spend my time here on planet Earth? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think for me, one of the biggest things that I learned is... I, you know, I spent so much of my life trying to hide from the world and trying to, you know, hide my story. I didn't really even think that I had a story. And now I just try to focus on, you know, how I myself can can grow and how I can help other people. And, you know, it's definitely challenging, you know, you know, on a daily level, it's definitely challenging for sure. And I think, you know, the biggest thing that I've learned is that, um, you know, like we were talking about, you know, playing games and winning the game. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that um, the only game that really exists is the one that's being played in your head. And the reality is, is that game is being played every single day. and I think ultimately it just comes down to who you are and, and like, are you proud to be the person who you are? Because I know for me, I didn't. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of my time on earth thinking about that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, God, God, what a start. And I think, yeah, dude, like it's so hearing your story is so incredible. And I think everybody should check you out on LinkedIn. You know, like your LinkedIn is incredible. You give these amazing bits and stories and value every single, you know, every day. And and um, and God, there's so much to unpack here. But what I really want to unpack is, yeah, how you were able to turn yourself from this guy who, you know, really struggled his freshman year, really couldn't figure himself out to a guy who started the Humans 2.0 podcast movement and really not only changed, you know, won the game per se of starting the best podcast and being in top 100 Apple podcasts, but really changed yourself in the process, 300 plus interviews and really, really grew himself. So the first thing I really want to talk about are, um, well, actually, I'll ask you. So there are five things that I have here, five things that I think really, really, you know, seem to be the thing that made the most impact on you. Tell me which one you think was the most important in building up yourself and your podcast. Okay. Your habits, your diet, your work ethic, your relationships, or the struggles that formed you? The struggles, for sure. Let's start there. Um you know, it's interesting. Like I look back to a lot of the things that I've done in the past and, you know, really before maybe 2016, I feel like a lot of the things that I did, I just like did them, uh, to really just like deal with like my own problems and my own stresses, you know? And, and I think there's a fine line between like your struggles, because I think a lot of times your struggles can fuel you, but, you know, I think a lot of times if you're in, that energy too much in that energy too much. Um, it can also hurt you, you know? And so for me, I think the fact that like, you know, I've lived days where, 
you know, I was depressed. I was suicidal. I was, uh, you know, obese. I had all these issues. I had no friends. I felt like the fact that I've lived those days and I was able to climb out of that struggle in and of itself. Um, that's like the biggest, you know, like, you know, quote unquote, like chip on my shoulder, because at the end of the day, there's like so many moments where, you know, like when you talk about this whole humans 2.0 movement, why I literally had no idea. And, um, and, and it's just kind of crazy to see how it's evolved. And, and I think at the end of the day, what it really came down to was that I didn't know it was going to be a movement, you know, but I think what I did have is I just, I believe that it did. And I just played the game every day. And I think ultimately it just comes down to those two things of like, um, believing and having faith. And then also just playing the game every single day. And just like, you know, when I was in the middle of doing those 300 interviews, I feel like I never really stopped. And I was like, wow, look what I've done. It was just like, all right, next week. Okay. Then the week after that, then the week after that, then I had this guy. Oh, I got to read his book. Oh, I got to do this. I, and so for, and then, so for me, it was just like, I was just always playing the game every single day. And I believe that it was going right. You know, even on the days where it didn't go right, but I believe the opposite. And I always made sure that, you know, before I fell asleep at nighttime, I always made sure to just like prioritize a sense of belief in just what I was doing. And then ultimately my, you know, my potential, you know, and I think just going to bed every night with that mindset, I think that's like the most important thing. Okay. So I have two questions from that. So one, how long did it take for you to go all in on the podcast? How long did it take for you to really get into it? And then two, you did this while you were in college, correct? So how did mm -hmm. you manage, quote, being all in on the podcast while also being a college student? Yeah, it's a great question. So I I got the initial idea to start the podcast and I think in the middle of 2017. And then by the end of the summer in 2017, I was just like, all right, I'm going to start this podcast. So you and were then, a sophomore? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like, I don't even remember about what, what I was in. And the reason why I said it is because, you know, I was in college, but, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily graduate. So I don't, I don't have a college degree and I ended up leaving. Um, and so, you know, for me, I wasn't really, I didn't really care that much about college. And so I had to make a decision. Um, and so for me, uh, so yeah, so I started, I got the idea to start it in the middle of 2017 towards the end of the summer of 2017. I actually did it. I started it, but I didn't really take it seriously. I would like post one every couple weeks. Then I would post like two in a day. And so it was kind of all over the place. And, um, and I remember like at the end of 2017, like literally the last day of the year, I remember I was literally just like, if I don't take this whole podcasting thing seriously, then like, what's even me the point of doing it? Um, and so I just like, remember like coming home, like on new year's. And I remember just being like, I have to like change something because I feel like I'm not getting the results that I want. And, and then I remember after that, I just started to, you know, like every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday, boom, 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 episode after episode, interview after interview. So you know, it didn't take me that long, but it's definitely a journey. I love that. So next question, therefore, is on the way up, right? When you were when you were in this moment of high focus, what were you focused on the most? Were you focused on social media, gaining hosting skills, right? Providing value or just getting the best guests? Um, that's a great question. I think all those at different times. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I, like I remember, for example, like I remember like my fifth guest ever on my podcast. I remember before we hit record, um, like on the podcast, he, he was like, oh, wait, uh, can you give me a second? I got to, uh, you know, make my LinkedIn post for the day. And he and then he was telling me on how like he's been posting on LinkedIn every day for like the last years and he hasn't like stopped or something like that. And I remember just like realizing i was like oh when like if he's doing that i should probably do that too and so i remember when that happened like as my fifth guest on my podcast i was like okay let me start working on linkedin so i definitely there were stages where i was where i was using that and i think yeah at the end of the day 
I think for me, um, really when I look at it, it was really, I think my rise and my synergy through like podcasting and LinkedIn, where I would like use my LinkedIn to get guests on, uh, like higher guests, bigger guests. And then I would use it to promote it and I would grow like this audience. And then they go to the podcast. And then, um, I think that is probably the biggest thing when I look back at it. Um, and it was sort of like this self-amplifying cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so actually, uh, the viewers don't know, you know, of course I hit you up about a year ago and I said, Hey Mark, my name's Nick Lugo. I'm thinking about starting up a podcast. And, um, and the thing that you told me you stressed, you're like, Nick, use LinkedIn. LinkedIn is your tool. LinkedIn is your friend. It is, it has been the thing that has carried me throughout. So I absolutely love that. Nice. Another thing that it's just crazy, man, but how did you get such great interviewing skills? You know, like as I listen through, I say, wow, like this man knows how to interview. And not only that, but your guests, like it's a phenomenon where your guests will come on and be like, by the way, dude, great. This is a great interview. Like you're doing fantastic. Ed Milet said that, which was like incredible. So tell me. That's crazy. Yeah. Right. So how exactly did you get, um, such great interviewing skills? Yeah. It's so funny. I, I like literally remember, uh, I was actually thinking about that today because, um, wow. uh, like, not, not, like what the whole Ed Milet thing, because, you know, it's interesting because I like what I've learned is that, uh, like it, it's a skill to help people in a certain way. And like, for example, like, you know, Ed Milet, you know, what he told me, I remember is like, if you see somebody who's like trying to work on a skill, you should like give them, you know, positive reinforcement to help them. And like, that's a, that's something that people can do to help other people believe in themselves. You know, I think that's so important. I always try to do that too. And I think Ed did that for me. And so when it comes to my interviewing skills, I appreciate it, man. I, I sometimes think so. And sometimes I'm like, oh, that was terrible. Um, but I think for me, you know, when I look back at it, um, I think it's really the fact that for me, I struggled with social anxiety so much. And I remember there was this period where I was really climbing out of that. And I, it, it was like in 2016, 2015. And I, I like really remember, uh, you know, I don't know how to describe this, but I really remember just like feeling like such a, for most of my life, I kind of felt like an alien because I felt like I didn't really have social skills or like introduce, like I didn't know how to introduce myself or talk to people. And I think obviously part of that social anxiety. And so for me, like I went through this stage where I had to literally learn how to talk to people in real life, you know, even before the podcast, you know? And so when I learned those skills, I got like really, really specific in terms of like, learning communication skills. And I had never really done that in my entire life. And so once I started to do that, then it was just like the gradual, you know, hustle of like, you know, interviewing hundreds of people where eventually I just like sharpened my skills. And, um, you know, I don't even feel like, I feel like a lot of times I didn't, you know, I tried to, I don't really try to interview people because I think at the end of the day, what I've learned too, is that um, you know, there's good interviewers, there's bad interviewers, there's good guests, there's bad guests. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's like the guest is going to say whatever they want to say. And so the, I think the key is to just like give them and create this space where, you know, they can kind of be like psychologically free without judgment. And I think if you do that and you, and you show the guests that you care, that you care, and you're not just some other podcast host who's inviting them or someone who's like in the media so to speak then a lot of the times the guest just like you know throws it out of the park or whatever that saying is you know so i think that's like the biggest thing i've learned so it's like really it's not really i don't even view it as being an interviewer or a host it's really just trying to be like some sort of a uh like a guide or like a conduit mm. for them if that makes sense i don't know yeah no i mean you know you um you you seem to care so much about people and that that that's something that like like i notice amongst everything like whenever we're, we're talking you're just like yeah, i'm trying to deliver as much value to people as i possibly can and well where you know i'm just wondering where did that come from right because you're sitting there saying you're almost an alien you're a little bit you know um outside of the the social realm so where exactly did you get the the deep desire to, and care for these podcast guests as well as just people in general 
It's a great question. Um, I know. You know I, yeah, you know, honestly, I think the first thing that comes to mind is just like existence. And, and, and I say that because it's just like, like when you, like one of the things that I'm grateful for was really going through like the worst period of my life where I was truly depressed. I was suicidal and really my brain felt like it broke. And when you go through something like that and you're like literally about to die, you basically like have your entire life flash before you, um, you're never going to be the same again, you know? And so I think once you reach that point, um, there just becomes a level where it's just like, if I'm not going to do this, I just would rather not be alive. You know, and so for me, uh, I, I mean, I hope that doesn't sound like depressing or anything, <laughs> but but for me, it's just like, what is literally the point of being alive if I'm not doing that, you know? And and, and like for somebody who, um, you know, like even though like, you know, my parents came to America poor and I grew up younger, poor, but then, you know, becoming successful, um, at least uh, to some degree financially, um, you just like are able to have really crazy moments where you just like don't have to work. You don't have to do anything. Um, and when you are in that level, then your mind either starts to think about basically, you know, you're too comfortable, which then doesn't actually put you in the best conditions to be yourself. So then you yeah. just try to escape life. But then the other half of that is also you just start to realize like, oh, you know, if I have, whether it's all this money or all this success or whatever it is, then you just reach this level where it's like literally the only point of that is other people. You know what I mean? Because if you have, if you have $65 billion in your bank account, if you have all the things that you want, but then you're just like on the earth by yourself. Like, there's no point to that. You know what I mean? Like, why would I have written a book? Why would I have started a podcast if it wasn't for technically other people, but also through myself too, you know? And I, I honestly believe that, um, I honestly just feel like everybody is living a life that is just exactly like yours, but just in a different set of circumstances. And I think, I think Jim Carrey talks about this too, where I've just learned that like, everybody is actually just me living their life. Yeah. Uh, but they were born in a different way. They have different genetics, but it's just me, like the same way that I think of myself. Like that's the same way that people, when they think of themselves, it's the same thing. And so I think like just understanding that um, just connects me to sort of just what the purpose of life is. So, so <laughs> let me ask you, I, I, Hey dude, no, I'm with you though. So let me ask you. So what do your relationships sort of look like today? So, you know, you develop a strong relationship with somebody, let's say maybe, maybe past podcast guests or friends or, you know, people in your community, what do those relationships look like today? Do you just spontaneously call people up or do you, do you, are you constantly interacting with them and, um, and, you know, having conversations? That's a great question. Um, you know, for me, like, I honestly, like I am someone where, I really only have just like probably a handful of close friends that I talk to and, you know, whether that's the introvert in me or whatever. And then I think that's because like in my, in my professional and my public life, so many people are trying to talk to me, you know? And so for someone like, especially me who's grown up as an introvert, especially with social anxiety, um, I think that I've just like learned that's, that's the best. Um, and so for me, like I only really try to, on a close level interact with just a handful of people. Uh, and I'm, I'm close with my family. I have a girlfriend. Um, so I just kind of, kind of stick to that. Um, and then in my just day-to-day -day life, you know, I meet so many people, I'm talking to so many people, uh, you know, one of the things that I like started doing was, um, like ever since kind of like last year, quarantine, the pandemic, stuff like that, I started to just like set regular times with people where, um, you know, someone where I wanted to get closer to, or maybe someone I had met online. And, and it's just like, Hey, are you free every other month on the second mm -hmm. at 3 PM? Or are you free every Tuesday at this time? Or are you free? You know? And so I think that for me has really helped. Um, and then also too, like, I also feel like sometimes, you know, in full transparency where I'll just sometimes get into these moods where I just don't want to talk to anybody, 
Um, and a lot of the times when that happens, you know, one of the things that I do, um, and, and a lot of times too, the reason why is because I sometimes just get obsessed with something. So like I find something or, or something in my business or whatever, and I just sort of get obsessed with that. And I just like focus on like hustling and working that I just like sort of forget to talk to people. Um, and, and I've built up so many different boundaries over the years, especially in terms of like social media and, and people contacting me and stuff just because of just being sane. Um, and so for me, like, you know, what I've learned is, um, it, it's really different, but basically what I'll do is like, I have a reminder in my phone that'll basically remind me every day. I think it's like at one, one or like two, 2 PM. Uh, and I chose those numbers for a reason. Um, and basically I'll get a reminder on my phone and it says like, Hey, text somebody you haven't texted, you know, for non-business reasons mm. or like non-professional reasons, you know? And so sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it's harder for me to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely been challenging for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine, you know, first of all, um, having non-business relationships when everybody's trying to gain things from you and, and <laughs> get value and things of that sort. Um, yeah. Let me ask you, so with previous guests, you know, how do you sort of, um, do you still talk to them? Do you have certain previous guests that have sort of become your mentors? And over time, do you think, you know, you've really um, kept in touch with a lot of the guests in which you, in which you connected with? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people, so um, I've interviewed a lot of people. So, you know, obviously not all of them, but I do try to stay in touch with a lot of them and, you know, different like, you know, when the pandemic started, for example, like I remember like reaching out to every single guest I've ever had and just like checking in on them, seeing if I can help with anything. So sometimes I do things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely have a handful of people who I've met from the podcast that, um, you know, are people who I still try to collaborate with today and, um, and talk to and, uh, and help all the time. Like there's countless people um, you know, who have helped me in very deep ways and I try to help them. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I, I, I also really like the idea that when you were in, when you're in college, you know, like I struggle with this pretty, pretty hard, actually, just the idea of trying to find the right relationships, trying to find the right friends. You know, I spent a lot of time, or at least I, I spent a lot of time going to parties and, and doing things of that sort. And I realized that, First of all, those are not the people that I want to hang out with. And second of all, you know, I'm not getting any any place by by going there. So at what point in your in your life did you really start to ditch the people that weren't a great influence on you and stop going to parties and stop doing those things and really start focusing on, okay, these are the these are the right people I should be around. And um and this this is exactly the place where I should be. Hmm. It's a great question. And I uh I saw this quote today and it said, um, choose the people who choose you. Mm. And I think that's really important because obviously, you know, I, I, number one is I believe that everything in life is just a reflection of what's going on inside of you. Right. So for me, you know, when I, you know, I think now that I've learned is that, um, you know, if I didn't, if I don't really love myself, I'm not going to be able to feel love with other people. Um, even if they're the best person, there's still a degree to where you can't do that unless it's by like sort of individually, like what you can control. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, it was just really this period where I was just like, what, like would, if I didn't, you know, reach out to these people or if I didn't, uh, um, you know, sort of get caught up in the same circles and cycles, then like what I really like want to be friends with this person. Um, and so for me, it was just a kind of a, a circle where, you know, for me, like when I kind of reached um, this moment where I was really working on myself, I, you know, I would say I kind of went down into the cave. And so I had this period where I didn't really talk to anybody for like six months. Um, but then once I got out of that cave and I started to kind of talk to people and recover from social anxiety, um, then for me, it was sort of like a fresh start where I was just like, okay, let me, let me actually take the friends that I know there's sort of a deeper connection with that. I can kind of see who they are. And let me just try to like be friends with those people. Um, and honestly, I think a lot of the times too, like you, 
it's a very common tendency to feel like you need like a lot of friends and maybe some people do, but I don't, I don't know about you, but I feel, I feel like for me, like you only really need one friend, two friends, three friends at a deep level who like truly get you. Um, I think to be happy. Um, and obviously it depends, you know, and, and I think for example, too, like, I think what you said about the environment is really important, right? So you can go to, you know, you can go to a college party, right? Which is just basically just little kids trying to get high and drunk and, and do whatever <laughs> and have fun, which is, you know, sometimes I guess that's okay. Uh, but then there's also other parties where you can go to where it's all people who are similar to you. And like, they're all trying to work towards a similar thing. And so I think just like being intentional um, about your relationship is important. And then I also think too, there's different kinds of relationships, So I think there's friends where you don't have to talk to them every day. You can just talk to them every once in a while and that's fine, you know? Um, And and so I think that's also important to understand too. And so I remember it was very challenging, you know? And so it was definitely very, very, very challenging, especially because, you know, like there's a line between, there's a line between cutting people off but also making sure that you are a good person and not yeah. trying to sort of just focus on yourself. So it's, it's an interesting line. I, I, I debate it a lot. Yeah. I mean um, it's, it's very difficult. I was just talking to someone about this. First of all, yes, I only have three to four really good friends and that's just sort of like, I like it like that because first of all, you can't really develop deep connections with, with more than those people unless you join a, you know, do it within a group. And I, I like those individual friends that I could sort of, that I could sort of pick out. And I sort of, you know, the way I think about it is, is kind of like, yeah, that cave, right? So let me ask you, whenever you go into these periods of, of being in this cave, um, what exactly are you, are you doing? You know, what are you, yeah. Like, what are you feeling? Yeah. So I, yeah. So I would say that I, I haven't really gone down to the cave. Um, you know, because I think the, the cave is really, so I think there's two kinds of caves, right? So I think one kind of cave is like what I did when I was first like recovering from social anxiety and like mental health problems where like, that's when I really didn't talk to people except for like my roommate, but I wasn't really there. Yeah. Um, you know, and so that, and I, I don't recommend people to do that, but then there's a different kind of a cave where, you know, I remember when I was writing my book, for example, I went down into that cave. And for example, I'm in, I'm literally about to write another book right now. I'm about to start the process. I've kind of started it. So I'm about to go down into the cave, (laughs) a a different cave. But I think that cave where it's about is just like all of my creative energy is going to just focus on that. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, I do other things too. And so what I try to do is like, I try to reserve the early mornings to on that creative energy. Cause I find that's the easiest period for me. And then sometimes late at night too. Um, I feel like yeah. I'm the most creative early in the morning or, or kind of later at night, not too late, but kind of at nighttime. Um, and then in the middle of the day, I just, you know, live my life and do what I got to do. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think there's two kinds of case. There's like the first one, which I said, which is like, I don't recommend anybody goes into unless for like extreme circumstances. Sometimes you do need to not talk to anybody for months, especially if you come from like an extreme background like me, but for most people, probably not. Um, and there's a second cave where you're like focused on writing a book or something where like, I don't know about you, but for me in the way that my mind works is. Once I get obsessed with something, I go all in and like, I got to like write about it and re- and watch things about it. And I just got to like do that all the time so that if I'm doing that and then I'm doing something else, it's very draining. So I think by cave, I'm talking about like really just like tunnel vision focus for a certain period of time on something. No, I'm with you. It's, um, it's the idea of switching costs. So to switch from one mental energy, let's say podcasting or writing a book to relationships and things of that sort, it's just too much mental energy. It's too exhausting. Yeah. And I would just say too, before I said that, I didn't even answer the part about relationships. Yeah. So what I would say is like, when I'm in that second kind of cave, when I'm writing a book, what I really try to do is like, I try to really focus on um, like switching my mind. So I try to focus on getting in different mental states. And what I mean by that is like, you know, early morning, 
I'll spend like the first part of my day just by myself, like writing, planning things out. But then later in the evening, you know, I'll go out to dinner with with a friend or or, or you know a couple friends to like totally switch my mind to something different. You know, I think that's also very important too. Um, but but it's not like you know I'm I'm like you know doing some intense strategy work. You know, I'm just like chilling and I'm giving my mind a break. So then tomorrow morning I can do the same thing again. You know, yeah. and so I think that's that's really important of just like you know consistency. And so yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's very important to just be in constant um, social communication, whether it's some little or some not so great form, you know, I mean, like some people can even do this, like with their dog. I don't know if you have a dog or whatever, but no. some people like they, they do that. And, and then I remember too, I was, um, I was listening to this interview with someone and this was like at the beginning of the pandemic or just like in the, like last year. And, um, and there, there's this guy who's an extrovert and he was basically saying how, um, you know, when everything was really locked down, what he would basically do is he would get in his car and he would go drive in like the most crowded areas mm. just so he could like while driving, see people's faces, you know? And like, for example, I know somebody else, um, his name is Dr. Uh, Don Vaughn. He's like this neuroscientist. He's also an extrovert. And he, he also tells me that like, he can only do work uh certain kind of work when he's with other people mm. you know and so i think a lot of times too you just have to learn how you work because it doesn't work the same for everybody you know i i in some cases like when i'm writing or whatever you know it's great to be by myself um whereas for some people they actually need to be with other people even if no one's talking to them but just physically around other people that makes them feel safe you know yeah. i don't necessarily have that uh maybe sometimes but that's also an interesting dynamic too. And I think it's really great for people like us who get like intensely focused on things. Actually, it was Ed Milet. Ed Milet, now that we're talking about him, <laughs> said, uh, he goes, I essentially live three days, right? First six hours, That's he only sleeps six hours. He goes, my first six hours of my day is working, head down, grinding, you know, the stuff that I really need to do to execute and get my day done. Second part of the day, meetings, you know, um, relationship building for work, things of that sort. And then third, six hours of the day is just, you know, relationships, living life, doing, doing experiences and living that part of life. And, um, I I've been starting to do that ever since I listened to Ed Milet say that. And it's been, it's been really, really wonderful. Like I highly, highly suggest it. So, um, so yes, I guess we're moving on to the next question. Next question. Has yeah. Can you, with... can you give me a second? I just want to grab some water. Yeah, I like finish it. this water bottle one second. I'm so thirsty. No, you're good. <laughs> All right. So yeah, the, the question that I was, that I was, um, you know, I guess, I guess it's just a question that I've been thinking about. So what exactly do you do for, I guess, tuning out stimulation while also getting good content because i noticed that throughout the day i'm always listening to podcasts and reading books and things of that sort but it kind of it kind of it causes too many problems i'm getting too much information and i'm constantly being stimulated i can't be okay just sitting by myself and whenever i'm like that i got i know i really i realize that i have to tune it back so how often are you consuming information consuming content and then how often are you just kind of like being and being okay mm. with just, you know, living? Mm. That's a great question. Um, this is actually something I think about all the time. Uh, you know, for me personally right now, like I'm in a see. I think it's, I think it's all about seasons. So for example, like right now I'm in a season where um, I actually, I feel like I really haven't been listening or reading or, or like watching too many educational things. Um and I think part of that is like, I, I've noticed that over the years, I go through different seasons where sometimes I'm like always tapped in. I'm always listening to a podcast, audiobook, whatever. Um, but then other times I don't. And I, I think it's just important to have both of those times because um, I think that's how your brain learns the best. You need to have times where it's just you. And then you got to have other times where you're just like learning, 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 you know? And so for me, um, I, you know, one of the things I actually started doing is I actually started this, um, like in the process of, uh, starting like this book club hmm. because I was basically like, 
honestly, like, I, I mean, I've I read a book last month. I read a book the month before. So, I mean, I've, I'm still kind of reading, but I really haven't felt like I have been too interested to like read a book in a while. And so for me, like one of the things that interests me is like having conversations with other people in sort of a community setting. That's what's interesting to me, you know? And so I was like, Hey, let me start a book club where every month we just read the same book and we just get on like a zoom call, like during the month or something. And we can just talk about it. Uh, very chill. And so for example, like I'm doing that to kind of like build a system around me reading books, you know? And so I think what it's really important is like, you have to have seasons where you're not really doing anything, but then I also think you have to have seasons where you're just like, you know, learning. And then I think, you know, for some people too, like you need to sometimes place yourself in a system to do that. Right. Whether it's, you know, every time you get in your car, you have like an audio book, um, or, or every time you do this, then you, you, um, uh, you know, you do that. And so it's interesting, you know, so I'm, I'm right now in the middle of kind of switching seasons to where I've kind of spent it now really learning that much, not really listening to podcasts, not a lot of that stuff to now I'm actually going to, but, um, in a very specific way, you know, like I'm about to write this, I'm about to start writing this book. Um, and, uh, I also want to make sure that I don't, can, I don't want to say like, I don't want to contaminate my thoughts, you know, it's like this next book that I'm going to write, it's going to be all based on, um, basically food. And so I've read so many food books and all this stuff that right now I don't want to read any books on food other than like looking at research and science to reference and quote, because I'm going to be super immersed in that world, you know? And so I think, I think like the ability to step into different worlds is very important. You know, like, for example, like the whole three day thing that you said with Ed Milet, I think it's really important to step into like that last chunk of the day where you're not working, you know, and you're not doing something. And I think it's just so important. And, you know, they've even showed studies that people who can be in more different states of mind uh, have much higher rates of being psychologically resilient and being happier. You know, and I think a lot of the times what happens is, and when I think back to my life, like I was just stuck in the same state of mind because nobody ever taught me how to switch my state of mind. And I realized that if I can switch my state of mind, a lot of times that changes like how I feel and and what I do about certain things, you know? And so I don't know if that made sense, but no, that's no. how I'd answer your question. <laughs> it makes a ton of sense. I mean, you know, um, Right now, I'm doing what's known as a content creation day. This is I got this from Tim Ferriss, nice. where literally throughout all of today, I am just creating as much content, you know, these bright lights and all this, all this recording equipment. But that's I do it in one day. I batch it and I and I get rid of it. And I really like that idea of okay, tomorrow is going to be a complete relaxation day. And to be able to to go from you know one to the other is just absolutely huge. Um, I definitely do want to talk about the microbiome and I definitely want to do- talk about, um, I'm a yep neuroscience guy, psychology guy. Oh, yeah. So how exactly, first of all, did this research and this idea of food and the microbiome change your life and why is it important? Yeah. You know, so it's so interesting. I think, um, and I, I've just been thinking about these things cause I'm like in like the story process mode of the book. I think my first ever moment where I started to realize that the food that you eat has more to do with how much you weigh. I think the first moment I realized that was, I remember one day being randomly on Facebook and I remember, you know, I have this uh, cousin in Egypt. Um, her name is Lydia and, uh, she's actually not here anymore. So rest in peace where, you know, she got diagnosed with a form of cancer And I remember she had shared something on her Facebook and it was basically like, Hey, here are like the top five foods that might cause cancer. And it was like a list of like all these top five junk foods that a lot of people eat and I'm including myself. And so I remember being like, Hmm, that's interesting. And then I remember, um, you know, as she died, I really started to think about that. I was like, huh, like maybe there's something to that. And so for me, my first kind of exposure to that was like, maybe there's something between um, you know, cancer and food, um, although it's a complicated topic, but then other than that, uh, for me, it was really just, you know, going to college freshman period 
and, you know, gaining a ton of weight, being over 200 pounds, being like obese for the first time in my life and going through that and also going through like mental health struggles, going through that eventually, you know, and at that time I, ha- I, re- I really had no idea what mental health was, even though I had mental health problems. Out of that, for me, like my one objective was just like, hey, I'm I'm overweight. Let me try to lose weight. And so I went on this journey like in, t- in 2000, uh, like the summer of 2016, where I just like tried to learn as much as I could about trying to lose weight and, and food. And I basically, you know, experimented with all these different kinds of diets. And what I really found was that, you know, food is really the number one way I think that you can control your brain, your brain health, which is what controls your mind and your mindset. And I think a lot of the times, like we forget that, you know, you're not just sort of like thoughts and emotions. You're also, you know, we're all sort of trapped, so to speak in like a series of biochemical feedback loops between the trillions of of cells in our body. And at the end of the day, if they have a problem, then that's probably going to affect your life. Even if you are the nicest, the happiest person, that could still mess you up. And and when I look back to my life, I think a lot of like one of the biggest reasons as to why, you know, I had issues with my mental health, with my confidence, with my self esteem. I think a lot of it has to do with what I was putting in my mouth every single day. And you know, for me, as I started to shift what I put in my mouth, that really I think was one of the biggest things that changed my state of mind uh going to speak and so i think that's really important yeah i mean it makes sense so so let me ask you right so what is the mark metry diet what did you eat we'll say in the last three days (laughs) you know so you know honestly i'm not going to create a mark metry diet or anything like that (laughs) but i think for me what i just advocate towards is just a like a brain healthy diet which is basically just not consuming any kind of processed artificial junk food, sugar, things like that. And just trying to focus on giving your brain what it needs, which is making sure that you eat basically a lot of uh, dietary fat with, with certain minerals and nutrients. And that's really the most important thing. Um, and there's different avenues that can go down. I th- I'm a big proponent of gut health. I think gut health is huge, uh, especially when it comes to social anxiety. And so for me, what I've really learned and in, in what in my book I'm going to try to do is I think that I've read a thousand books on nutrition. And to be honest with you, they are all overly complicated because basically book publishers require their authors to have 200, 300 page books so that they can, their spinal cord is, is big enough. I'm sorry, sorry. My phone is ringing. Give me one second. No, you're good. I, um, I actually have these, um, I have these alarms that go off every day on my phone. Um, at 10, 10 AM, 11, 11 AM, 12, 12 PM, one, one, and now it's three thirty three. Um, uh, and they like remind me of different things for like setting habits and whatnot. But, um, interesting. so yeah, so anyway, yeah. So, um, so, you know, to get back to what I was talking about. So, so yeah, I've read thousands of books on nutrition and what I've learned is that, um, the book is overly complicated, um, because publishers want thick books so that they can put them in bookstores and so they can sell, uh, books for cheaper. Um, and so basically like wh- one of the big proponents that I'm doing with this book is like, I want it to be as simple as possible. And so for me, I don't necessarily believe in, you know, a one size fits all universal diet. And I'll talk about this in the book, but like, I've gone, I've gone plant-based, I've gone keto, I've gone, I've tried different things. And really at the end of the day, it, it has nothing to do with with like a specific diet that's been uh, you know marketed to you, and they're really just different tools. Um, and so for me, I think the one universal thing is just trying to avoid processed foods, sugar, things like that. Yep. I think that seems to be a commonality for, commonality for everybody. Yeah. So you took a microbiome test, if I'm correct. Yeah. And, um, so what exactly, you know? what healthy foods were you eating that were causing problems in your microbiome and therefore your brain chemistry? Um, what healthy foods was I eating? Well, what foods and healthy foods, or we'll say your typical healthy foods that you would think of as healthy, but have dangerous effects. Um, 
I mean, I think, I think, I don't, I don't necessarily know because I think it depends on the person. Um, but I think a lot of the times, like, it's just like, you know, like I remember when I was a kid growing up, I remember I was like, I would eat like a corn muffin <laughs> because that was healthy or I'd eat like the strawberry pop tarts because I was like, Oh, strawberry, it's healthy. So I think that's the the big sort of, um, you know, sort of issue here. I, or like, there's this entire, you know, you know, where like you, if you go to a grocery store and you see the words like, Oh, this is vegan or this is fat free, or this is gluten free. A lot of the times, like these labels don't really mean anything. Um, yeah. They're just all marketing t- tips. And for someone who doesn't really understand much about nutrition, these there's a lot of sort of absolutes that people say that just makes things simpler in their head, but doesn't actually equate to reality, right? So people who say, oh, all, all carbs are bad. No, they're not. Your body needs carbs overall in the long term to survive. And there are some good carbs and there are some bad carbs, you know, um, you know, uh, oh, all, all, all milk is bad. Well, no, it depends on who you are. It depends on the sort, you know, there's a thousand different factors. And I think a lot of times like there's, there's like these different absolutes that have been sold. I was one time, I guess on this podcast, um, and, and I, I have the utmost respect for this person. I don't mean to, you know, say anything negative about them whatsoever, but, you know, I remember like this person that, you know, they had struggled a bit with their kind of weight and their food and they were kind of asking me for tips and they were telling me like, Hey, I'm going to go on a, uh, on an all fruit diet. I'm going to be a fruitarian. And, and, and I just think like, if you're doing anything to that level of extremity, that's not good, you know? Yeah. And so other than like just eliminating all junk food and processed food, I think anything uh, besides that, in terms of trying to like be super extreme, I don't think that's good. Um, and, and like what I really advocate for is just like a, like a human diet, like what existed on this earth before like the industrial revolution. Um, and then I also believe too, like, I also believe that there are definitely a lot of companies now that are being formed like food companies that are actually making great foods that are great alternatives for people. You know, like for example, you know, if you drink Coke, if you drink Pepsi, if you drink soda, there's this company called Olipop and they basically created, I don't know. Have you heard of them? Yep. Yep. Yeah. They've created this soda has no artificial ingredients and it also helps your gut microbiome because it's actually made out of plant fibers and prebiotics and all these different things. So it's like, if you're drinking Coke um, and, and you know, you're obsessed with it, just like I was, then you can switch over to that, you know, same with ice cream. You know, I used to be a fiend for ice cream. Um, honestly, I got to eat some more ice cream and, and, and not like regular ice cream, but I, there's like, there, you know, there's a handful of different companies. There's this company called keto. There's this company called rebel. There's this company called Fronin where like, they make all these ice creams that are all using natural ingredients. So I think that's like the most important thing. And then I think once somebody is doing that, then if you want to get into specifics about certain people and, and certain foods that are natural within those that could cause problems, and that's like a different conversation because I think if you if we can just get as many people to just like eat natural diets, um, then I think a lot of these issues are going to sort of solve themselves. And what I mean by that is I think a lot of the times, like part of the reason why, um, like if you eat certain food, right? Like if you eat broccoli or if you eat, uh, you know, potatoes or sweet potatoes, and then you feel your stomach act in a certain way or whatever. It's technically, it's not the broccoli's fault that that's happening. What's actually happening is that your gut microbiome either doesn't have the proper bacteria or has enough of the harmful bacteria to when you eat broccoli, your body has a reaction to it. It's not necessarily the broccoli, it's your body's reaction. And so the more that you actually heal your gut microbiome, the more that you can actually eat foods totally fine. So like, for example, like I remember when I first started my, like, you know, health, it took me about a, a solid year for me to really change my diet, like a hundred percent. So it definitely took me a little bit. Um, but I remember like, for example, I would eat healthy, like every day, like hundred percent consistent. Um, and then like, I would go to like, for example, McDonald's or I would have, you know, I'd have like some French fries or, or whatever I would eat. And then I remember I would just like get wrecked or I would like eat sugar and then I would just like get destroyed in terms of how I felt. But then now, for example, like, um, you know, like 
for example, like kind of a funny story, uh, like last weekend, I did end up going to McDonald's, um, just kind of like a rare, like I literally don't remember the last time I went to McDonald's ever since like three years ago. So it was kind of random. And like I ate it and I felt like 100% fine. And that's because I've really been sort of putting in the work just every day. And when you do that, you start to heal your stomach, your gut microbiome, and then your ability to eat certain foods, whether they're good or bad in a way that they don't harm you. You know, so obviously I don't recommend people to eat McDonald's or, or fast food in general, but um, I think the most important thing is just trying to eat a healthy, natural diet. Yeah. And that's first and foremost. So that was actually one of the things that I actually funny story did yesterday. So um, I I worked on my health. Like once I started going on this, like, you know, self transformation journey, uh, I was 16 years old, I'm 20 now, and I really, really focused on health. Like that was the first thing, eating healthy, doing things right. And yesterday I had some cookies and I was not ashamed of it and they tasted delicious. <laughs> yeah. I think honestly too, like, I think the the part of like feeling ashamed, I think that's really what trips people up, you know, because I honestly like I used to really not suffer as much as other people in terms of like food and like eating too much food and then falling in these toxic cycles where I'll eat a lot of food and that I shouldn't have. And I'm like, I probably shouldn't do this. But then I get upset and then I just keep eating. Um, you know, so I'm grateful that I don't, I don't really have that problem today. Like that's the problem where thank God, like that's one of my problems that have, has gone away. Um, but I know a lot of other people have that problem too. And I think shame is a huge kind of factor around that, that makes it worse. Um, you know, and it doesn't really make it better in most situations. Okay. So let me ask you. So, um, Food was for me one of the first things that that I changed, and it was also one of the first things that you changed. I think that's that's yeah. really really interesting. So, as you were going along this process, you know, as you were starting to develop yourself and things of that sort, what do you recall were sort of the other habits that were really really like influential? Yeah, and I think too, just on a side note about how we both kind of got into this first, that's literally why I'm writing my book, and like the, part of the reason is because like I I, I kind of want to use it as like a uh, is like a gateway drug to get people mm. to start thinking about other things, you know, because at the end of the day, every single person in the entire world has to eat three times a day or maybe two or whatever the number is. And so I think in terms of the number of people you're talking to, you're already starting off with a lot of people. And then I think too, I don't know about you, but for me, I was overweight, right? And when you get to a certain level, you can't hide from that problem because it's like in your physical reality, you see it every day. And I think a lot of people for them weight or like their body that I think is a, is the start because that's what they can see. But then once you get into it, then you start learning all about like this, you know, this deeper stuff. And so, you know, that's definitely why I'm trying to write my book. It's not necessarily because I'm passionate about food, although I am, um, but it's really as like a gateway to these sort of deeper topics. Um, I'm sorry. What was your question that you had asked me? <laughs> Basically. What are the deeper topics? What were the habits that you built on top of food that really yeah. changed your life? Yeah. So I remember I got started with food. And then I think, you know, what I started doing was um, I started going for walks. That was probably the other biggest thing because I had never really done that. Like I was very, I was not active my entire life. Like I didn't play any sports. Um, I was always just sitting. Um, and so for me, when I started to feel a little bit better about myself and I had more energy from my diet, then I just started to go for walks. And, um, and I think as I started to go for walks, that's also where like, I slowly got introduced to like the whole world of podcasting and audiobooks, you know, which then mm. will totally change your life in and of itself. And so I think that that really is. And I honestly, I, I think walking is still probably one of my top habits today. Like there isn't a single day uh, unless there's like a straight up blizzard outside where I don't go for a walk, you know, and even if there is a blizzard, I don't care, man. I'm, I'm either going that. outside or, or I'm just pacing in my house, like either <laughs> or I'm going to walk somehow, some shape or form, you know? And so walking, I think is so, so important. I think it's one of those things that it seems so simple that a lot of people overlook it. And I know for me, like if I'm stressed out, I'm, I'm having, I have anxiety, and I'm like, I'm so focused on my problems. And like, my, my brain is like taking me down like the spiral of how the world, you know, hates me and like how what I'm doing isn't going to work out. And then I just like go outside and go for a walk. And then I kind of find that maybe not in every case, but in a lot of the cases, 
I come back with a totally different perspective, you know? And so I, I think a lot of the times, and also like, I think a lot of the science that I've read too has shown that walking is probably the fastest way to get into like a calm, but alert state of mind and change your state of mind. So I think, I think that's been something that again, seems very simple, but it can literally change your entire life. And they've yeah. actually, for example, like there's this psychologist in the UK who did this experiment. Maybe you're familiar with it, where he basically had people who had like clinical depression, very severe depression. And what he basically told them was go outside every day when you first wake up and just go for a walk. And all I want you to do is I want you to just look up at the roofs of people's houses and like the, the sort of top part. And I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but basically he showed how a lot of people, even that, you know, people who are, you know, severely depressed, um, they felt a little bit better when they started to go for these walks for a variety of different reasons. Number one is, you know, I think there's, when I look at this conversation, a lot of the times it comes down to uh, brain health um, and sort of like the health of your brain. And I think a lot of the times, like, you know, this isn't really something that's talked about. I feel like generally speaking in like most mental health circles. Um, and it's basically this idea of like your brain is basically like, you know, it's like this complicated house plant, but it is a mm-hmm. house plant in terms of like your brain needs sunlight, your brain needs exercise and needs food, obviously needs sleep. And so, for example, like when you do that and you walk outside, you have sunlight, which is a huge part of how your brain grows and how it's, you know, pr- make sure it's properly regulated in your entire body. But then you're also uh, walking. So then there's your body's moving, your heart rate is, is changing. Um, but then also what's happening too in that specific ex- ex- uh, experiment um, was that you're actually looking up you know, and, and, and obviously looking up, it may seem kind of weird, but I remember when I was younger, I always looked down and, and, and as I kind of started to learn more about, you know, um, sort of the body skeletal system and, and physiology, you actually learn that, uh, a lot of your mood is actually based on how your body's positioned, how your physical body's positioned. And so like, for example, when you look up, whereas people who are severely depressed are looking down. um, But when you look up, it actually um, helps put your brain in a different state of mind where again, like I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to say like, Hey, people who are depressed, all they need to do is just go for a walk. All right. That's not what I'm saying, but um, it's a little thing that might help, you know? And, And I think a lot of times it's not any one habit, Although there are definitely some, I let's say like main habits, you know, like food, meditation, uh, exposure therapy, uh, you know, sleep, exercise, and then those are kind of like journaling things like that, like kind of main habits. But then I also think there are sort of small habits, like little habits, like there, and they're sort of more psychological tendencies, you know, where, for example, like the first thing I'll do when I wake up in the morning is I try to basically, um, okay, I don't necessarily mean this, but I'll basically treat myself like a dog to where the point is is like, yeah, even though my mind might not want me to do something, I'll still say like, hey, here's the leash and we got to go outside for a walk. And so for example, like, yeah. And so it's so important because I think a lot of the times people just expect that they should be happy. People expect that they should be focused. People expect that they should uh, have energy. People expect that they should be able to sleep or be able to talk to people. And I think a lot of the times that's not really true. I think all these things are skills, you know? And so um, whatever it is, it's super important. And so, um, and so, yeah, so in terms of the, the little habits that I said, um, you know, like, for example, one of the things that I always do is like, I, I do this more kind of in social situations. I don't really do it that much like in my house anymore, but it's like, there are these things called like doorway triggers. I don't know if you've heard of it, where if you walk under a door frame, that's a sort of like a cognitive cue to remind yourself of something. Right. And so, and then for example, like um, when my timer rang off on my phone, um, I have these time, these alarms set up on my day uh, on my phone, excuse me, to go off every single day at certain specific, the same times to remind me to do things, you know? And so I think a lot of times what I've learned is like, it's kind of moving with these big habits, like things that you know, that 
are important to like the foundation of your physical and mental health, like nutrition and exercise and sleep and meditation and journaling. Uh, and you know, a couple, maybe a couple other things, but then it's also like these kind of smaller little habits that are just very small cues, you know, and they may not even be you doing something. They could just be, um, just like reminding you of things, right? So like one of the things, for example, that I always remind myself of um, is like whenever I hop on a Zoom call, Mm -hmm. if it's video, I always remind myself that the person's facial reactions is not a representation of what I'm saying and how much they like it or don't like it. Mm -hmm. And like one of the reasons why is because like, so as someone who's faced social anxiety their entire life, um, literally my entire life, when I was having a conversation with someone, my head in my head, they would just tell me that person thinks you're a loser and they think you suck. And a lot of the times, you know, that's based on the person's facial expressions or my inability uh, to maybe read them accurately. And so for me, like what I've learned is like on zoom calls, especially like, because there's maybe latency in between like the, the connection time, like a millisecond or whatever, or because you're like listening and you're trying to focus and learning it's, you know, it's not as natural. Whereas in person, you know, you sort of have like more natural body language cues that kind of show you that. And so for me, I just kind of always remember that. And there's other, other things too, you know? Um, yeah, no, but- I mean, dude, I th- that was great, man. Like the amount of nuggets of wisdom there was, was absolutely incredible. But of course I do want to be respectful of your time. And, um, and first of all, thank you for having such incredible, like this was a great conversation and you clearly are a man of, passion so they're like every time we walk into these little subjects there are things that you're just incredibly incredibly passionate about and i could like i could tell i could feel it so tell everybody first of all why they should listen to the podcast social anxiety society and tell them what's going on in your life and you know well how they could support you because i think you're doing amazing things out here thanks man I honestly, I don't necessarily know why people should listen to my podcast, but I think the better question is who should listen to my podcast, you know? And so um, really what I would say is whether, you know, you are a student or you're an entrepreneur or you're a leader and you basically want to improve the way that you show up in the world as your true self, then you should listen to my podcast. Um, And then, yeah, people can just find me if they just go to my website. Uh, M-A-R-K-M-E-T-R-Y, my first and last name.com. And, uh, you know, I'm, I try my best to always be open. You know, I, if anyone ever has any questions or any way I can help them, you know, feel free to reach out to me. And, um, and yeah, I think that's kind of the best way. Did you ask another question? Nope. Nope, dude. That was great. And, um, and yeah, dude, uh, definitely, you know, he actually is very open, you know, like I hit him up again a year ago and, and he answered and we had a 17, 17 message conversation. So it was really, really wonderful. So Mark Metry, thank you for coming on. This has been wonderful. Dude, you're awesome, man. You're a killer host. <laughs> Thanks, man. Take care.